Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, many thanks for the invitation to present today. Um, I've been asked to give an update on concussion, particularly post the recent Armstrong consensus meeting in October of last year. And uh, this was a group of world renowned experts and both clinicians and researchers who came together to discuss the research that has been done in concussion over the last four to five years and try to collate the most up-to-date research in regards to both concussion identification, management, and long-term outcomes. So this meeting, as I say, took place in Amsterdam last year, and the publication of that research was in July of this year in the British Journal of Sports and Exercise Medicine. So I'd like to take the next 15, 20 minutes to maybe pre present some of this um, latest uptake and research uh, and its relevance to the community game and to people playing rugby at the non-elite level. So as mentioned, this was the sixth international conference of concussion that took place in Amsterdam last year. Uh, and the publication then was in the British Journal of Sports and Exercise Medicine over two um publications in July of this year. So with regards to concussion, I suppose the first thing that they wanted to undertake was what is the definition of a concussion? And how they define it specifically in relation to sports is it's a mild traumatic brain injury caused by a direct blow to either the head, neck or body. And I think firstly, it's important to be aware that the definition doesn't suggest that it has to be exactly a head impact that a, a force that can be transmitted to the head from a knock to the body or neck can also cause a concussive episode. Um, it's important that with regards to that, that you're not waiting for it to be a specifically a head impact. And that also important is that symptoms may be delayed in onset. While the majority of symptoms may present immediately, they may also evolve over the coming days, particularly up to 72 hours after a head injury episode. So just to be aware that not all players or individuals will present with symptoms directly after the episode. Of, of note, um, no abnormality is seen on standard scans or imaging. So things like CT brains or MRI brains would be normal after concussion. And really these tools or um, devices are used to outrule any more serious pathology um, particularly things like a, a brain bleed or something where there's more serious concern. But unfortunately, the current technology won't be able to diagnose a concussion from uh, a scan or an imaging test that you have done. Um, the range of symptoms uh, do not always involve loss of consciousness. And I think that's important to be aware that it can be less than 25% of concussions will actually have a loss of consciousness. So not to be waiting for a loss of consciousness for this to be a diagnosed concussion that you don't need to be knocked out for this essentially to be a concussion. I think that's a really important message to be aware of. And I think the knowledge around that has, has evolved over time and people are much more aware of this. What happens is that there, there's a cascade of events in terms of internally that we can't specifically measure where the neurotransmitters and brain energy systems are affected and that, that's why the signs and symptoms can evolve over time um, and lead to different presentation of symptoms at different time points. In the context of Irish rugby, um, I'm making this relevant to us in our presentation, the IRIS study, which has been undertaken in the University of Limerick since 2016, would look at the rates of injury across both amateur rugby in the AIL and schools rugby within uh, schools senior cup. And within that, it's been noted that over every season, really concussion has been noted to be the highest injury uh, in terms of prevalence um, and incidence. And that likewise within schools rugby, again, concussion would account for approximately 14% of all injuries within the AIL game. It's a, a somewhere between 11 and 14%. And slightly higher in the women's game between 10 to 19 percent depending on the season so certainly this is a common injury uh, and something that we need to be aware of and, and, and well clued in terms of how to manage it and be up to date in terms of the research 
Um, the average length of time off from a concussion within the amateur game is approximately 27 days for men and about 30, 51 days for women. So certainly within the amateur game, there seems to be a delayed return to play within the female game. And whether that's down to lack of access to maybe medical care or prolonged symptoms, that is something that needs to be investigated further. But overall, the research would suggest that there is no difference in terms of return to play between men, males and females in sport in other settings. So this may well be a reflection on the level of medical care that maybe people are getting in the female game and that maybe a delay in diagnosis potentially is causing this. In schoolboys, the average duration off was about 30 days. Again, some of that's going to be mandated by the RFU with regards to their mandatory stand down of 23 days for under 18s and 21 days for the over 18s or amateur game. So the key bit in terms of education and how to manage concussion really is around the recognition. Um, and with regards to that, one of the newest tools that was developed within the um, consensus meetings was the concussion recognition tool six. So this is a specific tool used for non-medical personnel. Um, so those who are attending a game as a coach or parent or even as a non-medically trained assistant at a game. Um, so within this, there's a framework of things that are important to look at. So one of the most important things at the starting point is the red flags or things that we look for that would suggest something more serious than a, a concussive episode or would warrant further um, immediate medical attention. So within that, you'll see the, the middle section there has a red flag section of things that would be warrant the, the contact of the emergency services. The next page and the following page then has a breakdown of things that would help us to identify a concussion once the red flags have been ruled out. So within that, they would look at things where maybe some visible clues or things that the injured individual might display in terms of a loss of consciousness, maybe some balance problems or things like maybe a brief seizure or unsteadiness. After that, then it's a question of what the person themselves or the individual may present with or the symptoms that they report. So in this situation, they might describe some physical symptoms, so maybe emotional symptoms or even changes in their cognition or thinking. So sometimes people may present with immediate symptoms of just confusion or feeling like they're just a bit disorientated or potentially that they just aren't quite aware of their surroundings. Anyone presenting with immediate symptoms, particularly of headache or dizziness on the pitch, should be removed straight away as these are people who will tend to have prolonged symptoms if it's not recognized. Finally, they give a advice section around advice to give to someone with a suspected concussion if they're not being um, transferred to the emergency department for further um, onward referral. So these should be medically assessed before any return to play. They shouldn't be left alone, particularly in the first three hours, as this is a time period where worsening of symptoms might warrant medical attention. They shouldn't be on their own and again, should not use alcohol or recreational drugs that would potentially confuse the situation and may lead to altered cognition and presentation, which would then confuse the, the presentation of the individual if they were to have further, more serious underlying medical conditions. Again, they shouldn't drive a motor vehicle until clear to do so as there is a concern about a post-injury seizure, and that would cause, obviously, uh, a serious road traffic accident if someone's to drive in that situation. So the number one thing that can be done for a certain person in this situation is to remove them from play. And, that, and the staying should really be, and this is the common across all games, is that if you're in doubt, you should sit them out. Um, the reason for this, obviously, is to prevent any further episode so people who continue to play with symptoms of concussion will develop a much more severe concussion if they're to get a second episode which will lead to much more prolonged symptoms so certainly this would by removing them from a second injury you would reduce the severity of concussive episode and shorten the duration of any symptoms post that injury the other serious thing to look out for is a thing called second impact syndrome and this is where if someone received a second 
head injury or a second concussive episode that there can be a very rarely um, ev- episode of significant brain swelling, which can be very serious and lead to seizures and also in some cases can be fatal. Um, so this is obviously a very important thing to recognize and prevent from happening. With regards to the then those who've been diagnosed with a suspected concussion, particularly within maybe an amateur setting where there hasn't been medical input, it is definitely been shown that the earlier someone receives medical attention after a concussive episode, it shortens the duration of that episode. So within the medical setting, whether it be that with their primary care physician or a sports care, a sports physician or someone who specializes within concussion, that the players should be reevaluated. And usually once it's past 72 hours, they have a devised a device called the SCOTE 6, which is the Sports Con- Concussion Office Assessment Tool. There's also a child-based version of this for those who are 12 and under. And this is a multimodal um, assessment, which involves both a symptom checklist, neurocognitive testing, some balance assessment, assessment of vestibular function, autonomic nervous system assessment, and then also a neurological and cervical assessment to outrule any more serious pathologies that need to be treated prior to managing the concussive episode. It does incorporate screening for underlying issues such as anxiety and depression, and these are not mandatory, but may be optionally used if the person was to present with prolonged symptoms that maybe are being complicated by the development of maybe some anxiety symptoms or depressive symptoms that can commonly occur after a concussion, but also if present prior to concussion can lead to more prolonged symptoms. As I say, this is best used within 72 hours to up to 30 days post-injury and can be used um, within the setting of a primary care setting and takes a bit of time to do, but it can be gives a very good direction towards where if treatment needs to be directed in terms of rehabilitation, this can help guide that. With regards to the rehabilitation of concussive episodes, I think it's important to be aware that most episodes are self-limiting and that will resolve spontaneously on their own. It is important to be aware though that 30% of people will experience post-concussive symptoms or up to, or what are now called persisting symptoms. And that's slightly higher rate in those under the age of 18 as they will tend to take a little bit longer to resolve from symptoms. Prolonged rest is no longer recommended. And I think this is an important um, message to get across in terms of the return to activity after a concussive episode. And it's been shown that those that are prescribed prolonged rest actually take longer to recover and that a self-limited and self-directed return to normal activities of daily living within the first 24 to 48 hours is actually important. So allowing people to do normal, low level activity in terms of walking, activities of daily living, but maybe reducing screen time for the first 48 hours has been shown to reduce the persistence of symptoms. After that 48 hour period, I think it's important then to encourage return to exercise in a very graduated and personalized way. Within that, it's worthwhile aiming for a low level of activity with up to about, if it's not prescribed, 50% of what would be considered the maximal heart rate that that produces symptoms. So if that's something that you're not able to have prescribed by a physician or a physiotherapist, then aiming for about 50% of your maximal heart rate in terms of a bike and low level 15 to 20 minute activity on a bike is usually quite a helpful thing from the starting point. This will then be progressed on as symptoms are tolerated and can progress on to a maybe running based activity over the following 24 to 48 hours. We're happy that as long as there's only a very mild exacerbation of symptoms, that this is okay to progress on. And within a mild exacerbation, that would really be graded as something where it's approximately a one to two out of 10 in severity. So as long as the symptoms aren't increasing by more than one or two out of 10, and are resolving quite quickly, then we're happy for people to progress on in their rehabilitation to allow them to return to activity, as this has been shown to be the best um, treatment in terms of reducing the the prolonged nature of symptoms after a concussive episode. 
So within that return and rehabilitation, this is a simple guide that would guide the staged and graduated progressions. Within it, you can see that those first few days of step one is a symptom limited activity that don't exacerbate symptoms. And then generally progressing on to that light exercise of up to 50 to 50% of a max heart rate. That can be simply calculated by a simple formula is 220 minus age. Within that, that might be a stationary bike and that's usually quite beneficial as it prevents any head movement and then progressing on to say maybe moderate activity or increasing heart rate running based activity. The first light blue section is safe to progress on without the need for medical clearance. And this is really designed to allow people to return to activity, which is both helpful, but also is good in terms of their progression back to reincorporation into both training and their sport. The second um, darker blue section should be used as after someone's been cleared to return to maybe a training based activity. The upper section would be one where there's a low risk of any further injury and there's no risk of any head impact at that stage. Whereas in, once you start to progress into that lower section, that is when the risk of maybe a further or subsequent head injury starts to increase. And that's why we'd like to delay that bit until medical clearance. Important for both students and even those returning to work is this return to learn um, process. Again, this is individualized and the majority of people will have returned to full learning at approximately 10 days. However, it is important to be aware that up to 40% of individuals may have some academic dysfunction or disability when it comes back to learning in terms of struggling in the schoolroom, struggling in the classroom in the first couple of days after a concussive episode. And that by not recognizing that it can lead to um, prolonged symptoms again. Again, these are the people who really would struggle in this situation are those with the greater initial symptom burden. So those who present with maybe very severe symptoms on day two to three after a concussive episode, they'd be the ones who maybe would be more likely to benefit from a personalized approach to their return to learn, where maybe some modifications around the length of time the person goes back to school or maybe re reducing the amount of homework in the first 24 to 48 hours will help with the return to activity and return to normal learning. With regards to the return to sport, the average time to being symptom free is approximately 14 days and return to sport is approximately 19 days for most athletes. Again, this doesn't tend to vary between males and females. Um, but there is a slightly longer duration for those under 18, up to 16 days uh, and then 19 days versus nine days and 15 days for the those over 18. Factors that would increase that time tend to be that delayed removal from a game. So someone who suffers an injury within a game and then plays on with persistent symptoms. As mentioned earlier, delayed access to a healthcare professional can also be associated with a delay in return to play and also initial higher symptom burden and severity of symptoms at the time of presentation has consistently been shown to predict how long someone will take to return to play. With regards to onward referral, those who are struggling with persistent symptoms, those with recurrent episodes of concussion, those complicated but maybe symptoms suggestive of a mood disorder with anxiety symptoms or low mood, maybe issues around sleep or reluctance to engage in activity. And those with parental concern or the athlete themselves is concerned should really be on, should be referred on to a specialist who looks after um, individuals with concussive episodes and would understand the management going forward. One of the new areas that they've looked at within the consensus statement is the ability to reduce the level of concussive episodes. So there is increasing evidence for the use of mouth guards, and this would have come from ice hockey within Canada. But certainly some of the previous studies in rugby would suggest that maybe while non-statistically significant, that the use of mouth guards has shown to be beneficial in reducing the number of concussive episodes. Other ways we can look at that is in terms of policy change, and obviously the IRFU have brought in the reduction in tackle height, which has been shown both in France and abroad that has reduced the overall incidence of concussion. The reduction of contact within practice sessions has been shown to reduce the episode of concussion within NFL 
and has been taken across throughout rugby where the level of contact is reduced throughout the training week to prevent the number of concussive episodes in training. And that is evident within the statistics in both the IRIS study, which shows that the number of concussive episodes within training is actually very low. The majority of concussive episodes seem to happen within the uh, match setting. Another thing that has been shown to reduce potential concussive episodes is neuromuscular training warm-up, which was shown in England to reduce the episodes of concussive episodes and all injuries. Uh, and this is something that can be coordinated through the strength and conditioning coaches prior to a training session. And then important is the early identification of a concussive episode to reduce any recurrent um, episodes as early identification and management reduces the severity of the subsequent episode and how long that person will take to return to play. So again, early identification, recognizing and removing that individual is probably key to preventing further episodes. Finally, a question we get asked is when should someone consider not playing a contact sport anymore? And this isn't specific to rugby, but can be across all sports. But I think those that, while there's no specific set guidelines and no specific evidence to guide this in terms of factors we would look at people who maybe have have prolonged symptoms or persisting symptoms after a concussive episode obviously if there's any neurological abnormalities on a physical examination those people should not be cleared to return to rugby until that's fully assessed any deficits on neuropsychological testing despite time away from contact sport again would suggest a need for reassessment and it should really be a multi disciplinary approach where the person is seen by a number of specialists who work in concussive uh, management who will be able to guide the decision around returning to contact sport or avoiding contact sport. One of the things we look at is concussions that are maybe evident after a lower impact. So maybe a, a transmitted force causing concussion that previously wouldn't have, or obviously anything that has any structural abnormalities again would be warrant a further neurosurgical or neurological review. And these are all things that need to be taken into consideration. This should obviously, of course, be balanced by the benefit of prolonged participation in activity and physical activity, which are both shown to reduce the incidence of future both mood and neurological disorders, as well as the benefit of team-based sport for reducing the episodes of anxiety, depression, and isolation that can occur when these are removed. So just in conclusion, it's important again to re-emphasize that early recognition reduces the severity of concussions of episodes, avoiding strict rest as this will only prolong symptoms and actually the earlier someone can return to activity that the shorter the duration of their symptoms will be regardless if they've returned to play. That using exercise in a prescribed way and progressive manner is also beneficial as treatment for a concussion and that early referral is, is, is warranted and will reduce ongoing symptoms if the person is not responding to the usual care. So let's like thank you for your time today and we look forward to welcoming any questions that you may have. Jamie, thanks for a really interesting talk. So we have a few questions coming in now. So it's one from Sinead. She's got two questions. She said a teenage son's got bad concussion when playing rugby and has developed bots due to this injury. Is this common? So we'll ask that bit first. Uh, so POTS, I assume she means postural orthostatic tachycardia, which is a kind of a, a sympathetic um, overdrive that happens after head injuries. Now, it can happen for lots of different conditions, but in essence, this is kind of a disturbance of the autonomic nervous system. Um, and this is a recognized occurrence in concussive episodes. It, it probably was under-recognized, um, but is now on the kind of standard concussion assessment tool, particularly the office-based tool. Um, so this is a recognized kind of complication that can occur, um, but if it's been managed well and symptoms have resolved, then then that's a really positive outcome. And because a lot of the time these things get under recognized. So certainly that's a positive outcome that it's been recognized and managed well. And that he sounds like he's been able to get back to play. Yeah, she says he's back playing, completing the head injury physio via neurology and under the care of cardiology. Um, should she be concerned about a secondary concussion? Yeah, I suppose generally it depends, again, where you talk to people, but I suppose the, the biggest risk of a complicated concussion is having had a previous concussion. Yeah. But generally what you find is that the, the biggest risk 
or things I ask people to look out for is either a concussion that's taking a long time to resolve or one that's happening with less and less impact. So if someone's having a recurrent concussion and it's actually from, say, a blow to the body or they're holding a tackle bag and they get a concussion versus a really kind of significant trauma. There is some some groups who will say that once you've been rehabilitated fully and symptoms have settled from a concussion, you've been rehabilitated and everything's cleared, that there's no increased risk of concussion. But again, that's it's possibly debatable. I think that there's always some element of risk, um, but you have to balance that out versus the desire to continue playing a sport, the social inclusion, the benefit from a physical point of view, um, all of those things that are kind of positive effects of playing playing sports. So I suppose it's a, it's a balance. Uh, like anything, there's always sm- there, there is always some elements of risk, but it's just balancing out what the, the benefit is and, and then kind of making an informed decision that way. Okay, thank you. Uh, Damien says, if I have concussion, uh, what are the next steps? So I think this is probably where the new concussion guidelines probably give a, little, a lot more direction um, and give people a little bit more control about what they can and can't do or should and shouldn't do. And, and probably the key bit is, is, is the early introduction of exercise after 24, 48 hours below a level that brings on your symptoms. So actually getting out, firstly, not staying in a dark room for 24, 48 hours, which seemed to be the previous advice. So obviously reduce screen time in the first day or two to reduce the kind of symptoms and severity of symptoms. But after that, kind of resuming activity is tolerated, getting out, meeting people, simple exercise in the, in the form of going walking and, and then and then kind of an, an, a symptom limited exert, um return to activity in terms of maybe on a bike or something like that and actually just building up the level um, and going through those steps as in the talk that kind of return to play criteria um, what what's also been shown to reduce the the risk of kind of um, a worse concussion or, or prolonged symptoms is an early interaction with a me- qualified medical professional those people who've seen a clinician early do better um, they don't tend to have as prolonged symptoms and get kind of guided towards the right rehabilitation for those people that need it early um, so I think that that's probably a key factor within it. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question here from uh, a team doctor. He said he's a team doctor for an amateur club. Um, where can he access specialist care for ongoing for players? So for us at the moment, so the UPMC obviously have a concussion network um, that's established around Ireland at the minute. So that there's available clinicians probably in, in lots of the country now covering a significant part of the country from Dublin across to the south to the southwest midwest uh, and and north as well so there's certainly good access if if you go onto the upmc website and look at the um concussion network there there's availability of clinicians there who have access to both neurocognitive testing from a neuropsychological testing online impact testing and then also specialist kind of physiotherapy and um vestibular rehab um, so there's a good network there if people want to look on that as a kind of a guideline for maybe players that need a, a assistance with complicated concussion. Yeah. Okay. And actually, on the you can see a tab there for about it's about UPMC. So we'll have the other uh, clinics around the country on that one as well. Um, so now the question now it's nothing to do with concussion, but you're happy to answer it, Jamie. It's about oh, how yeah. You're saying, yeah. <laughs> Uh, how do you diagnose the severity of an ankle sprain after initial symptoms have subsided? Um, so again, it, 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 without seeing the person or knowing the situation, I think yeah. the ability to weight bear after three, four days and get the swelling down is usually the key bit we look at. Yeah. Um, w- once a player in our care, if you, if, you, if you imagine in the rugby club I work for, we, we'll look at maybe some loaded exercises in, in, in terms of their ability to do a calf raise, do a weighted calf raise. And then we have a kind of a, a guide in terms of our return to run, which will involve kind of a, a number of hopping type exercises and things like that before maybe introducing some straight line running and then change of direction. Um, once that's clear and the person's clearing all through that, then we'd be happy enough to reintroduce to training. Um, I think the important bit with kind of the common ankle sprain is that a lot of people will suffer from ongoing symptoms or recurrent ankle sprains, and they're the ones that can cause problems long term. So I think whatever about the initial injury, 
it's the recurrent injuries are the ones we have to watch out for because they can cause damage to the ankle joint if they're not managed properly. So they'd be the ones where if you're getting someone who's getting recurrent ankle sprains, again, it'd be worth linking with the physio or a sports medicine doctor just to kind of get a proper yeah. assessment in that situation. I think in this case, it's a teenage son that you know he couldn't walk, but 10 days later wants to go back into training and has no symptoms. And they were just wondering, was there a standard protocol to show yeah. he's not returning too soon? I, I think that thing of being able to, first of all, walk, weight bear, pain-free, hop both forward, laterally, those things are, want those clear. And then introducing some straight line running, then some change of direction. If they're all clear, then I think there's, 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 um, there's no issue. I think, again, once people have suffered an ankle sprain, we'd normally strap their ankles actually for a period of time afterwards because the risk of recurrent injury. Jamie, thanks very much for joining us. And these talks will be live on our website if anybody does want to go back in or redirect someone to them later.